All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna go ahead and make our own version of a super hyped beer, Heady Topper. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome to you. Thanks for checking out the channel. My name is Steve. I'm the apartment brewer. And here on this channel, I will typically do grain to glass videos like this one, but I also do shorter, more informative videos like uh, equipment reviews, system builds, etc., etc., and educational videos as well. If you like that sort of thing, please hit that subscribe button and also check out my channel page for more of my content. All right, so if you've been in the craft beer scene for more than 10 minutes over the last like eight years, you've definitely heard of this beer. It is absolutely legendary legendary, especially on the East Coast. Heady Topper is the beer that pretty much pioneered the actual hazy New England IPA style craze. Heady Topper is brewed by the Alchemist Brewery in Vermont. This is a very hyped beer. It gets a lot of people very excited. I think it's a pretty tasty beer. Um, that being said, it is definitely not what we would consider today to be a New England IPA. The whole hazy New England IPA style has really evolved ever since Heady Topper came out. This is a more bitter beer than most people actually prefer their hazy New England IPAs to be. As for me personally, I really enjoy this beer. I think it's a well-made IPA and it's definitely something quite unique. However, it's definitely not my absolute favorite beer out of them all. Regardless, it's a damn good double IPA and we're going to do our best to actually make our own version of it here today. So if you scour the depths of homebrew talk forums, you will find a post that is about 99 pages long and about eight years old on cloning this beer. No one has ever really figured it out. One of the reasons why is the Alchemist's uh, hop selections for this beer actually do change. Uh, and also, of course, the actual flavors of hops have changed as well. If you taste Simcoe, for example, from eight years ago versus Simcoe nowadays, there's a drastic difference. So a lot of things have really changed that make this particular can of Petty Topper a lot different than a can that was made years ago. So anyway, what I discovered when going through this post was that a lot of people came very close uh, to the actual Hetty Topper flavor and experience, if you will. Towards the end of the thread, you will find a recipe posted by a user by the name of, uh, I think, Bob's Brews or something like that. And it is a pretty solid recipe that pretty much everybody thereafter uh, seems to agree tastes very, very good, makes an excellent double APA, and is pretty much the same thing as Hetty Topper, or at least as it was in like four years ago. But we're gonna go ahead and try to make this recipe for ourselves using his recipe as inspiration. I added a couple changes and a couple tweaks to that recipe just for my own system, as well as according to the ingredients that I was able to find, I did actually have to order a lot of this stuff online. Uh, so we'll see how this ends up, but I'm more than excited to actually try this out. Anyway, to get all nice and hyped up here, we're gonna crack into this can. Oh yeah. And uh, have a little 2021 Heady Topper. It's good. You know it's good. It's a little more bitter than your typical New England IPA. It's a lot more West Coasty than you might expect. Hetty Topper is a very unique beer simply because of when it came into existence in the time that it did, it really challenged West Coast IPAs in terms of what hops could do. Um, this is not as bitter as a West Coast IPA, but it's a hell of a lot more fruity. It's a lot more full body and it has this very flinty kind of character to it in the mouthfeel that makes it feel very different from a West Coast IPA. You are supposed to drink it from the can, but I pour a little bit into a glass. And you see that it is actually rather orange colored, nice and hazy, has a good kind of off-white head. This year it seems to be a really exotic kind of combination of tangerines, oranges, piney resiny flavors. Oh, jeez. This is not an adjunct heavy New England IPA that has a ton of thickness to it. It doesn't feel thick in the mouth. It just has this kind of, 
uh, heartiness that is coming, I think, from the malt. The malt character in this is quite sweet and quite substantial, and despite having calculated over around 100 IBUs, this beer really is quite balanced. So today's New England IPAs tend to kind of push the boundaries of the sensory experience of hops, um, and this really kind of is on the upper end of that scale, but I've had a few beers that have really gone overboard on hops. What The Alchemist has achieved with Hetty Topper is an extremely balanced, yet incredibly, incredibly hoppy drinking experience that is, um, still, to this day, I would say quite unique. And we're gonna go into the recipe section in a little bit here. However, what I want you, the viewer, to keep in mind is simply that this is not how you brew exactly the beer that is Heady Topper. As with most commercial beers, it is impossible to get it perfectly right. You don't have the exact same equipment, you're brewing on a small scale, you don't have every single piece of the puzzle, and, and the recipe to Heavy Topper is actually indeed a heavily guarded secret. So we're not really going to get 100% of this beer. We are gonna get very close, and I do believe that we can uh, achieve a really good double IPA through this recipe. However, just keep in mind it may not actually be exactly the same as the 2021 Heady Topper. If you are interested in making an excellent double IPA and would like to follow me in the footsteps of Heady Topper, let's go ahead and jump into this recipe section. So be forewarned that this recipe is is a little different than my typical beers. There are gonna be some extremes that we hit in terms of ingredients and um, you're just gonna have to strap in and be okay with that. So we're gonna start out with 13 pounds of Thomas Fawcett Pearl Malt. Pearl Malt is pretty unique in terms of its flavor. However, if you want something that's gonna be similar because you don't have access to pearl, then I would suggest going with something like Golden Promise or Halcyon as a base malt. An English pale malt is the core of what you want. The next ingredient is going to be three quarters of a pound of light British crystal malt. Um, the recipe suggested that you use Thomas Fawcett Caramalt. However, I could not find Thomas Fawcett Caramalt specifically, so I'll be using Muntins Caramalt. Um, and that comes in at about a 15 uh, Lava Bond malt. The caramel is going to add sweetness and body to the beer, and that is indeed evident in the way that this beer tastes. The next ingredient is going to be three quarters of a pound of white wheat malt. Uh, again, if you can find the Thomas Fawcett version, it's probably going to be the one that you uh, want to use. Lastly, we're adding three quarters of a pound of dextrose, or corn sugar, into the boil. Uh, around the end of the boil, that is just gonna bump up the gravity and help the beer kind of finish out a bit drier. So all in all, the entire grist, including the sugar, should get us up to an original gravity of about 1076. Um, if you wanna target somewhere plus or minus five gravity points, that's fine, but you wanna end up with a final ABV calculated of about 8%. So we are targeting a final gravity of 1016 in order to get about 8.1-ish. Um, so for hops, well, well, there's a lot. Uh, first of all, what we need to do is add what's called a hop shot, which is hop extract that comes in a syringe. Uh, it is extremely highly concentrated, so we're targeting about 89 IBUs of bitterness from this hop extract, and uh, the one that I was mailed gives me about 55.4% alpha acid, which means that I need to add about 18 milliliters of this hop extract at 90 minutes in order to achieve that. The hop extract has the benefit of cutting down on the overall plant material in the beer, which obviously helps in transferring. It also dramatically cuts down on the amount of flavors that are imparted by the hop material, things that you don't want, like kind of grassiness and astringent flavors that can happen if you had too many hops in there. So then we add our hop shot at 90 minutes, and then we boil for 90 minutes, and we don't add anything during the boil. John Kimmick has, is on record as saying that he doesn't add any hops during the boil. And, well, that's what we're gonna do. Now the next stage is the Whirlpool, and that is where all the flavor from these hops just gets infused into the beer. So what we are doing is a single, giant, 20 minute Whirlpool at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are adding five different varieties of hops into this Whirlpool. And, uh, well, it's a lot. So, we are adding two and a half ounces of Simcoe, one ounce of Centennial, three quarters of an ounce of Amarillo, three quarters of an ounce of Apollo, and three quarters of an ounce of Columbus, all into the Whirlpool. So after a 20 minute Whirlpool, our calculated IBUs are around 126. 
just keep in mind, IBU doesn't actually directly coordinate to bitterness, and the can itself doesn't actually say how many IBUs are in the beer, uh, but many sources have cited it as well over 100, so I think 126 uh, should be fine. Next, we're gonna go do one giant dry hop. Uh, we're gonna add an ounce and a half of Centennial, an ounce and a half of Simcoe, an ounce of Amarillo, an ounce of Columbus, and three quarters of an ounce of Apollo, five days into fermentation. This hits the end of the biotransformation period and goes into the beginning of the post-fermentation period. Uh, and what this is gonna basically allow for is kind of the best of both worlds. This is an absolutely massive amount of dry hops and it is going to cause a huge amount of plant material to be in the beer. So we don't want these hops to be sitting on the beer for very long. I am going to dry hop for no more than five days. And after that, I am actually going to physically remove the hops from the beer. Um, yes, this does risk a little bit of oxidation, but with my fermentation setup, I can blow out any sort of oxygen. I can purge the CO2 uh, even if I open the fermenter. So that's a little bit of an advantage there. If you don't have that advantage, just get your beer off of those hops as soon as you can after about five days have actually come to pass. For our yeast, we're gonna use Imperial Barbarian. This is the Conan strain. The Conan strain is what Hetty Topper is fermented with. End of debate. So for the water profile on this beer, um, there, there really is no right answer. Um, Hetty Topper is weird with its water in that somebody posted a screenshot of them having over 750 parts per million of total hardness in their water. Many times more than is actually recommended for anything. Uh, so that's a lot. We're not gonna do that. However, we are going to actually amp up the overall total hardness in general to a pretty extreme level for most IPAs. And this is actually gonna bring us with a sulfate to chloride ratio that is absolutely astronomical. Uh, sulfate to chloride ratio increases the perception of brightness and hops and also bitterness. Um, and I'm not sure how that's gonna work. However, I've never actually tried pushing a sulfate to chloride ratio as high as this beer is about to. Um, so it'll be interesting. And based on the way my beer turns out, that should give you some idea of whether or not to actually try doing this particular water profile. So this is the water profile that we're using and just brace yourself. It's 171 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 26 parts per million of sodium, 71 parts per million of chloride, 407 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. So, in order to get this profile, we are adding 20 grams of gypsum. Yes, you heard that correctly, 20 grams, three grams of Epsom, two grams of sodium chloride, and two grams of calcium chloride to the mash. Believe it or not, that's going to actually result in a proper mash pH, hopefully of about 5.3, and uh, we'll see how well that works, because holy hell. <laughs> and speaking of the mash, last but not least, uh, nobody really knows what goes on with the mash for the uh, Hetty Topper beer. So what I am going to do is a plain old 90 minute rest at 152 degrees Fahrenheit, right down the middle, Plain and simple, I think it'll be a pretty good representation of what we can get. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a huge experiment, and uh, I'm really excited to do it because even if it doesn't make the exact same thing as Hetty Topper, uh, it still will make probably a damn good double IPA. And that for itself is actually worth quite a bit. So hopefully you guys enjoy. Let's go ahead and mash in. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached the required dough in temperature, I doughed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit for 10 minutes and I took a pH measurement and I saw a measurement of 5.43, which is about on target. That indicates that the massive gypsum addition in the water profile did indeed adjust the mash pH to the proper range. Uh, I then let the mash sit for about 90 minutes at 152 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I raised to 170 for the mash out after that. Once I reached the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes, and then I pulled the grain basket out. 
and let that drain for another 15 minutes. Then I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and I recorded a measurement of 13.8 bricks or 1056, which was only two points lower than the target pre-boil gravity. Once I reached the boil, I added the 90 minute hop addition, which was actually 18 milliliters of hop extract, the hop shot. Funnily enough, this comes in syringes that explicitly say for oral use only, um, and I would not recommend following those instructions. Don't ask me how I know. Then I let the boil continue for another 80 minutes. At that point, I added some yeast nutrient and the three quarters of a pound of dextrose. <laughs> Lastly, I started recirculating boiling wort through the chilling system to sanitize it. Uh, regardless of whatever chilling setup you have, this is definitely the best way to ensure it's sanitized. Once the boil ended, I actually let the wort just naturally cool off until it hit 180 Fahrenheit, which does not actually take that long. Uh, and then I used the heating element to maintain that temperature. And at that point, I added the massive Whirlpool addition of two and a half ounces of Simcoe, one ounce of Centennial, three quarters of an ounce each of Amarillo, Apollo, and Columbus. Um, and I'll let that stay there for about 20 minutes. But after the Whirlpool was mostly complete, then I took everything inside where I could hook up my chiller to the sink and uh, set it up for chilling once the Whirlpool was finished. Uh, so I just kind of prepped it while the Whirlpool was going on. One thing that I did differently this time that I think really helped was wrapping up my kettle with tin foil uh, to cover up any of the openings that would allow hop aroma to escape. So this way it could lock everything in uh, and it made the whirlpool a little bit more effective. Once the whirlpool was done, I let the wort chill all the way down to 70 degrees Fahrenheit and then I aerated everything with a blast of pure O2 uh, with a dose of about one minute and 15 seconds because of the high gravity. At this point, I pitched my yeast starter. And then I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 17.5 bricks or 1070, which was up there, it's good enough, but it was still about six points short. So for the fermentation of this beer, we're looking at a, a longer process than usual for our typical hazy IPAs. Uh, what is critical during this process though is that we minimize the amount of uh, overall oxygen exposure to the beer uh, post fermentation. However, in this one, because we have such an absolutely enormous dry hopping addition, it is kind of a, a threat. So what I am doing is I'm using my conical fermenter to ferment this one with. You don't need that, but what this allows me to do is pump CO2 into the beer from below. And this basically pushes CO2 uh, from bottom up and that allows me to actually push oxygen out of the fermenter actively as I open it up and Put in the massive amount of dry hops uh, If I was adding a smaller amount of dry hops, there are various easier ways to do this oxygen free um, However, this is just a feature that my fermenter happens to have that I can yeah, take advantage of in this case You really don't need a conical to do this beer You can actually really just do this in an anvil bucket fermenter if you want to But what you do need to do is ensure that you have absolutely minimal exposure to oxygen over the entire fermentation Including your dry hop and what you also need to do is be able to get your beer off of the dry hops after five days of dry hopping has completed and that means either racking into a keg or a secondary fermenter of some sort and then preparing for a little bit of conditioning time. The recipe that I'm following adheres to uh, the principle that Heady Topper is actually uh, around 28 days from brew to can, uh, which is actually a long time for an IPA. That may have something to do, however, with the massive amount of dry hops that are added. This causes a sensation known as hop burn. That takes roughly a couple weeks to go away, but there's also a second thing, and that is called hop creep. Um, this is a phenomenon that I've experienced a couple times and I try to rush dry hopped beers. But basically without getting into the actual science of it, long story short, when you dry hop uh, a beer, you're actually adding additional fermentables 
a very small amount of them into the beer and the yeast will actually restart fermentation and if you move to a cold phase right after you're finished dry hopping uh, you actually end up making a diacetyl bomb by accident so basically to cut down on both the hop burn and the potential of hop creep we are going to add a two to three week uh, warm conditioning phase at the end of fermentation after we dry hop. This will allow the beer to mellow out and it will also get rid of any additional diacetyl that was created due to the dry hopping and hopefully gives us a very clean, bright, and wonderful hoppy flavor at the end of it. The last thing is the Conan strain is a very fruity strain, it's a very expressive strain. However, it is an English strain of yeast and as a result, doesn't really do very well when it's fermented too warm. Uh, you'll start to get some rather unpleasant flavors out of your yeast if you ferment it above 65. So again, we are following the recommendations of the recipe itself and fermenting at 63. We're gonna be holding it at 63 the entire time and that includes during the dry hopping phase as well. Once again, the dry hops are gonna be added on day five for no more than five days and then removed from the beer or the beer will be transferred off of the dry hops in one way or another. And then at that point, you're good to raise the temperature up a few degrees to hold it for that long diacetyl rest and uh, allow the yeast to clean everything up. So in a nutshell, this is what we are doing. We are going to pitch our yeast and ferment at 63 degrees Fahrenheit for five days. On that fifth day, we're going to go ahead and add all of our dry hops at once. We will let the dry hops sit in the beer for five more days. And we are still holding 63 the entire time. Then I will either rack the beer off of the dry hops or remove the dry hops from the beer, whichever is more convenient. Then we will raise the temperature of fermentation up to about 68 degrees and we'll hold it there for two to three weeks. After two or three weeks have passed, I really should be good to package. Um, and at that point, we could probably force carbonate and uh, enjoy the beer. And hopefully it is pretty good. So I'll catch you in probably about a month. Final gravity for this absolute hop bomb of a beer is coming in at about 1010, uh, which is right on target. Puts us at about 8.0% ABV. All right, so now it's been about a month since I pitched the yeast, which is right on terms of the uh, fermentation schedule that I outlined earlier in the video. A lot of times nowadays we're looking at making IPAs as fast as possible and as quickly as possible and rushing them, and um, that sometimes works with certain types of flavor characteristics, but with this particular beer, it really did need the full month. It's just simply a beer that has a true overload of actual intensity of flavor and just requires that much more time to actually get completely ready. Uh, when I tasted this beer when it was young, like two or three weeks ago, uh, it was extremely bitter. It was unpalatably bitter, and I really thought that I had actually added too much bitterness to it uh, to the point where I thought it was maybe going to be ruined, but in fact, time was indeed, as usual, the best friend in this situation. But letting this thing sit at room temperature for about a full week and then giving it two or three weeks of additional cold storage uh, really did make this beer so much better. Uh, it rounded out those hard edges that it had and it muted the harshness that it had initially. And now that really harsh, intense, raging bitterness that I tasted uh, a few weeks after I had finished the fermentation is now gone. So if you are making this beer yourself, I would highly recommend following that fermentation schedule at least. Uh, for as long as I did, because it does really allow this beer some time to grow and mature, uh, and that's a big deal for this. This beer really did turn out very good overall. I'm very happy with the flavor and the experience that I'm getting with it, so let's go ahead and pour it so that we can talk about how it stacks up to the real deal. Uh, so I called this beer Heavy Hopper, and it comes in at 8% ABV and 126 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it pours a very dark gold, uh, almost an orange color actually with the way that this looks there. Uh, very hazy overall. There's a nice fluffy white head on it, uh, but it doesn't stick around for very long. It does collapse back into the beer. However, it does leave good lacing on the edges of the glass. And overall, it's a pretty decent looking beer in my opinion. It has a much darker appearance than your typical hazy New England IPA does. Uh, and that's true with the actual Heady Topper as well, simply just because of the uh, extra caramel malts that are involved. 
Also, Thomas Fawcett Pearl is a bit darker of a base malt than the typical Pilsner and white wheat that is used as base malts in modern New England IPAs. Now let's go ahead and go into aroma. Uh, the wind is actually blowing the aroma right at my face right now, which is awesome. But the aroma I'm getting out of this beer is extremely dank. It is a very pungent smell, <laughs> uh, but in that, you know, that very nice, dark, hoppy way. It has a lot of tropical fruit behind it as well, uh, but it's mostly dominated by that really strong kind of just dank character. Overall, the aroma is very powerful and it does not deceive you into thinking that this beer is not hoppy. It is a uh, very telling, very powerful aroma that gets the point across. Mouthfeel on this one is definitely a little bit less uh, full than your typical hazy IPA uh, as for nowadays. However, it is definitely uh, fuller than your typical West Coast IPA, and it's got more substantial character to it than most IPAs. What is really striking me as being different about this one, though, is that there is a substantial minerality coming through in the mouthfeel itself. Uh, so what mostly is apparent is a distinct chalkiness, um, and I can tell you right now that that is 100% from the gypsum edition, the absolutely massive gypsum edition that we did per the recipe. Otherwise, the mouthfeel is very dry. Again, we had a massive sulfate to chloride ratio, so that makes it feel drier than it actually is. Um, and that kind of is manifesting itself here as well. It has fullness, but still dryness and chalkiness and minerality all in the same time. All right, so now let's go in for the very interesting and in my opinion, very delicious flavor. The flavor on this one is extremely complicated and this is without a doubt a very good double IPA. Talking hop flavors first, uh, it's extremely resinous. It's very piney um, and dank. There's a tremendous amount of Columbus and Simcoe in this recipe, both of which really do heavily contribute towards that kind of dank, piney, resinous character. Um, it smells really good and it tastes really good overall. I'm a very big fan of the resinous hop flavors, but a lot of people out there aren't. The bitterness on this is not even close to what I thought it would be perceptively. Believe me, when I put those syringes of uh, hop extract in the boil at 90 minutes to bitter, I was really concerned. And it took a lot for me not to change that part of the recipe uh, and not to adjust to make it less bitter on paper. But the final beer is really not that bitter and that's very perplexing to me, but a pleasant um, result. But for 126 IBUs, on paper you'd expect your face to melt off, but in reality, it's not even close to that. It's actually quite delicious. So on top of that bitterness and on top of that resinousness, uh, we also get a really nice, very strong grapefruit punch. You get lots and lots of kind of semi-bitter fruit, like a grapefruit, you get some melon in there and some citrus as well. However, it's not even close to the typical uh, tropical fruits and sweet fruits that you get like oranges and tangerines and stuff out of modern uh, and more common New England IPAs of today. Now on top of that, we also have a decent amount of malt complexity that's really coming through. Um, I, let me say, first of all, it's the first time I've ever used English pearl malt before. Um, and wow, that's really good. I'm really pleasantly surprised by the rather unique base malt flavor that's coming through with this. No, most base malts kind of have like a white bread flavor, but the pearl malt has kind of more of a cereally uh, brown bread flavor. So it's a little richer um, than your typical like two row. Uh, it's closer to Maris Otter, I would say. It's not as biscuity as Maris Otter, though it's kind of less biscuity than that. Um, there is some biscuitness in there, I suppose, but it's, it's really not at all like Maris Otter and it has a little less residual sweetness than uh, Golden Promise does. I mean, there's, there's, you know, obviously some contribution into this grist with um, the white wheat and with the crystal uh, malt that was used as well. There is a little bit of sweetness in there, but it's overall kind of covered up by the hops, but it is nice to get a nice, pleasant tasting, sweet, 
ish uh, and complicated base malt character coming through in an IPA. That is something you really need. You can't just have nothing but hops and a boring malt palette. You need something interesting in an IPA to keep it good. But the burning question is, how does this beer that we made compare to Heady Topper, the actual beer, uh, as of 2021? And I was going to actually go ahead and pour a, a can of Heady Topper here and do a side-by-side, -side, but the video is getting very long at this point and I don't want to waste your time because it's not the same beer. Um, truth be told, this beer is a different double IPA entirely than the Heady Topper that we have um, in the fridge. But that being said, it is still a great double IPA. This is still a very good recipe. And as far as double IPAs go, this is actually among my favorites that I've ever made. Um, definitely a big fan of this particular recipe in terms of getting really nice, clear hop flavor and some really pleasant overall notes with a very strong punch as well. But it's not Heavy Topper, and I guess I, when I go into the potential improvements section here, it's just difficult for me to decide whether I want to do a potential improvements as if I was making a better double IPA, or as if I was making, you know, a recipe that was closer to Heavy Topper. Well, this is a great double IPA, and there's very little I would change. However, if you want something that's going to be closer to Heavy Topper, I think you would probably want to change a couple things. First of all, this finished way too dry. It is overall a lot more bitter than Heady Topper is, despite all of the uh, intentional bittering that we did. Heady Topper has a lot more residual sweetness and it has a lot more kind of residual malt complexity, if you will. So there's something missing in the recipe regarding that. If you're using the recipe that I'm using here, um, I would recommend just raising your mash temperature and perhaps adding a little additional unfermentable sugar, so perhaps some dextrin malt or a little bit more caramel malt. You kind of want to be easy on the caramel because if you get too much caramel flavor in there, then that's going to make a completely different beer, and Head Topper doesn't have that. Secondly, we have a completely different hop character. This is a very pleasant hop character, and I really enjoy it. However, it's a little bit less fruity than Heady Topper. Heady Topper has a lot more kind of the new world character of uh, the orange tangerine character that's mixed in with the resinous and piney character uh, that you would have in this beer. Um, so this, this to me feels a lot more West Coasty. Um, it's closer actually to Plenty the Elder uh, than Heady Topper. Uh, so if I was, again, using this recipe, I would maybe recommend pulling out some of the Columbus and the Simcoe and perhaps replacing it with some more powerful New World hops. Um, again, I don't know what the hop bills for Heady Topper are, but they do change and, and maybe there's some Galaxy in there. Maybe there's some El Dorado. Hops like that might add a little bit more of that kind of sweet fruit that you're looking for and that I found in the can of Heady Topper that I tasted earlier in this video. Other than the color, it's simply a lot different than the beer that is Heady Topper and um, that doesn't necessarily make this a bad beer. I'm very pleased with the way this turned out. I will probably be using hop extracts in the future when I try to make extremely hoppy beers that need a bittering charge, uh, like, like another West Coast Double IPA. It's a great technique and it cut down on the overall amount of uh, hop material that was floating around in the beer and gave me a little more beer at the end of the day, and that's always a good thing. The last thing I would change is the water profile. I'm sorry, but I just can't do the chalkiness. There's no real reason to add that much gypsum in unless you're using it to correct for pH, which is what the Alchemist does. The last thing I would change is bringing that water profile down to a more balanced profile. I think the added minerality helps, and I think the sulfate chloride ratio of three or four to one is still appropriate. Um, but the ridiculous water profile that we had here didn't really help this particular beer. It ended up feeling too dry, it wasn't balanced enough. Cloning a beer is a very, very difficult thing, and in reality, it's very rare to actually nail it. Uh, but if you do, and you're using ingredients and recipes that are very different than the actual beer, that's okay. More often than not, on the homebrew scale, we actually often end up using completely different ingredients and completely different processes than the pros do to get the same effect. And I think this beer and this recipe may be a result of trying to do exactly what the pros are doing on a homebrew scale, and it doesn't always line up. Even if this recipe didn't really reach the amazing complexity that is Heady Topper, let that be a reminder that John Kimmick and the Alchemist really do know what the hell they're doing and made a pretty amazing beer that is still captivating people today and 
causing headaches to people who are trying to clone it. But regardless, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and found it useful. And if you did, please hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button as well if you like more content like this. If you want to support the channel, please go ahead and check out the merch store that is down in the description box down below. You'll find the shirt I was wearing at the beginning of the video down there, along with a bunch of other types of merch such as hats, pint glasses, sweatshirts, hoodies, that sort of thing. Uh, please feel free to check that out if you want to support the channel. Additionally, if you're interested in other ways to support the channel, I have a variety of links to various uh, manufacturers of homebrewing equipment that I do recommend down in the description box. It includes the claw hammer supply system that I brewed this beer with. Feel free to check those out if you happen to be in the market for some new equipment. Last but not least, if you want to support the channel on a more personal level, I do have a Patreon as well, uh, and that is also linked in the description box. If you want to follow me on more social media than just YouTube, I am active on Instagram and Instagram only as The Apartment Brewer. So go check that out if you want more frequent updates than what you get here on YouTube. Thank you very much for watching, everyone, and if you're still here, you are my true fans. Thank you for watching all the way to the end, and I appreciate you quite a lot. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end, and until the next one, cheers.